This is a WBZ special presentation. Hi, I'm David Wade, and tonight we are excited to bring you a WBZ original documentary. You know, a Greater Boston starts by celebrating the traditions that bring our communities closer. So for the next hour, we're going to take you to Gloucester, where St. Peter's Fiesta is in full swing, to spotlight one of the best events of the year around here, the legendary Greasy Pole Competition. We are proud to present Love and Grease. and balance. A couple of the things you need to conquer the greasy pole in Gloucester. I don't think anybody understands it unless you're up there. Going out there and walking, it's a battle, you know? Well, you gotta refuse to lose. Everyone's getting drunk, everyone's excited. Eva! Eva! It's literally like taking that, that walk of faith, that leap of faith. I get just excited now as I did when I was five years old. To me, it was just the most fascinating thing in the world. This, yeah, this means the world to me, honestly. Relentlessness. You identify as a Gloucester person, Nothing stops you, including going all the way out to the end of that flag. What is your understanding of this? So all I know about it is that people try to get the flag, and it's like greasy, and it's the best show. There's a whole platform where all these crazy guys, all decked out in costume and stuff, wait their turn, and then they try to walk this. Long, long pole that's loaded up with grease. And you try to walk or run or do whatever you possibly can to get out to the end to grab the flag before you go down. It was kind of a local thing, you know? Number one is this idea of an ordeal, you know, where where generally men would try to prove their prowess, their masculinity, uh, in kind of a healthy competition among comrades to accomplish some feat. If there's not some danger, if there's not some risk, then it's really not a test. Okay, let you be boys now. Go ahead. They don't say women can't. We're just intelligent. I mean... <laughs> the greasy pole tradition was brought over from Sicily about the 1930s. They, they wanted to see who had the best balance and they were taking rough seas, so they mimicked it with a telephone pole of grease. When you have a maritime society, certain skill sets would be useful, you know, in, in a fishing community. Balance, dexterity, bravery. These are skills on display that you would want in your crew. You go out and try to kill yourself together. That's the way I look at it. Let's go try to kill ourselves today. Every day we go through things that we call ordeals. For the people who get on the pole, the ordeal then has so much more meaning to them. It's tied to the sacred, the sacredness of the ethnicity, the community, um, you know, being part of representing something that is important to them. It's um, a reconnection to what brought us here in the first place. It's in my blood. I, um, my father had walked for 17 years. My father won it when he was younger. The generations of either grandchildren or sons or friends or relatives, they want to walk with the champions. It's a tradition that's been passed on through generations. So a lot of people, their fathers, their grandfathers, their uncles who have done this, who have been participating in this thing, you know, it's, it's, it's embedded in their soul. When you win, it's a blackout. It's like, it's like the world goes gray. And it's just a feeling you honestly can't explain. The end of the greasy pole is in a different part of the universe. You know what I mean? Once you get to that last four feet, you don't always remember what happens. Go, go, go. 
It's really hard to explain. I feel like you almost get into this like blackout mode where like it's 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 really hard to like control what you're thinking, feeling. You grab it, everything goes quiet. And it's like kind of like a dream. It's like it's not really happening. So it's the idea of transcendence, transcendence of the material realm. Is it possible to experience that without dying? Is it possible to experience yourself as sort of being out of the body? That's what the ordeal can do, because you get that experience of the ineffable or the indescribable, being separate from yourself. And grasping that pole at the end is not just dying, but it's like being reborn. That's the most unbelievable feeling I've ever had in my life. If I won the lottery, it wouldn't even compare to that. It's a great feeling, though, once you get to the end of that pool and you do that with your friends and family watched. That is a, uh, that was one of the greatest feelings. I was born and raised on that pole. That's what I used to play out there as a kid. And uh, the dreams of winning it was all that mattered. And um, it was the most amazing feeling in the world. It took my breath away getting carried through the streets of my own little neighborhood. You know, they, they don't put you down for nothing. They'll carry you everywhere you want to go. Basically, you have everyone jumping all over you. You can't breathe. You think you're going to drown. You have the flag up in the air. It was like, it, probably one of the, other than getting married and having my kids, thank you, hon, uh, <laughs> probably one of the greatest experiences of my life. It might not mean a lot, you know, the rest of the year, uh, but when you win, you know, for a very brief moment in time, you know, you're, you're kind of like a celebrity. Well, and I hear I did it, did it. It means the world. Uh, I was over uh, Sleepy Palazzolo's house, and he was uh, terminally ill. And I didn't realize that his two daughters that were sitting in the room heard me whisper to the guy that I'd win for him. Thank God I did. Uh, and then, I don't know, next, he passed away that night. The next day, I met his daughters on the beach and gave him the flag. Surreal. Didn't feel like it was real. The ordeal is a collective experience. Everybody is sharing in it. It's, when somebody falls and hits their head on the pole, everybody grimaces, everybody feels it. You have, you have a different um, view of life when you grow up in a family where you have to take it in stride that you might not see your dad again. And that's just him going to work. And sometimes they'd be back when they said they were, and lots of times they didn't come back for months. It's bad weather. You knew that we were all on prayer. We all prayed. And when we knew that a boat didn't make it or someone didn't make it, you knew. It's like, what are we going to do for that family? I think their faith was their lifeline. The faith of the family at home and the faith of the fishermen out on their boats because they'd be praying in a different way. But that faith was that lifeline that connected the household, the family back here in Gloucester and those out on sea. When my husband was fishing, there were storms, and you couldn't get in touch with them as easily. They would go from boat to boat to say, you know, they're so many miles behind us. When you're out at sea, the only thing you got is what you either know or what the guy next to you knows, because once something breaks, you're the engineer, you're the carpenter, you're the electrician, you're everything. It was a lot of anxiety back then. They didn't have the technology that they have today. So you can imagine what this was doing to the culture here. This was a town of widows and orphans. You know, Gloucester lost more fishermen during the Civil War than they lost men on the battlefields. I know people would watch to see their masks come through uh, around the back shore to see them coming home. We were losing, on average, 100 men a year. Fishermen from Gloucester go where the winds of fortune blow, and danger is a sober certainty. But nature brings its tempters low for reaping what they didn't sow, 
Cause it's the toll for harvesting the seas Oh, the cries, the pleas The women on their knees Praying that they're missing fishermen Come home And the whole thing of the fiesta isn't a carnival. You know, it's the blessed of St. Peter saying to all the fishermen, you're home safely. You are saying, I am home. I think everybody wants to feel that community. That's the exciting part. The family aspect of the village is everybody getting together and, and feast. It's a feast of St. Peter. Gloucester is a very connected community. My oldest daughter said, I have to get out of town before I accidentally marry a cousin. <laughs> and that's not a joke. One of my friends used to joke that in Gloucester, your family tree is a wreath. Yeah, you pretty much know everybody or related to everybody kind of social life kind of goes, gets a little gray. People come in from all over. Um, they fly back home to be home with their families and friends because they know everybody's here that four days. And it guarantees you, you can hit all your friends up in four days. It's like fly home. They don't even fly home for Thanksgiving, but they fly home for Fiesta. Oh, it's huge, it's huge. It's, it's almost like uh, Christmas in the summertime. Oh yeah, there's no question for people down the Ford, especially Fiesta's bigger than Christmas. We actually changed the words to the song, it's the most wonderful time of the year. There'll be greasy pole walkers and big same boat talkers grow louder as Sunday draws near. So we have a little parade in my neighborhood. It's just kind of added a little spark to Fiesta. No permit, we have no permit. It's just the neighborhood. The kids get involved in it. That makes a lot of people happy. Fiesta is just a great way to see your family, see your friends. People that come to my house, I, I don't know a lot of them. They come with my friends, they come with my family. And I always tell people, bring good people, and good people come. St. Peter's Fiesta, I think, simply means a way of connecting the past with the present for a lot of the younger generation. They want help, they want to be together, they want their faith to be an integral part of who they are. I think most people come here and they can feel the energy. There is a palatable spiritual energy. The, the way to understand a ritual is that it's oriented to the supernatural, like this is religious. So they have St. Peter there, and he's the patron saint of fishermen. These are community rituals. They, they reaffirm the social order. They put on display the institutions, the, the prominent people in the institutions, everybody comes out and is visible. And so you understand how society is composed and it's done on a kind of intensified, condensed form right through these ritual practices that are packed with a lot of meaning that the local people understand. Viva San Pedro. Are we all deaf, dumb, and mute? You no, know, I can't hear you. Scream. Viva San Pedro! So, and through the streets, they sing that, and they honor in St. Peter. Someone will start the chant, and people always respond. I lose my voice every year. So almost like a call and response. Viva San Pedro! Just brings the people together. I think everybody wants to feel that closeness. Everyone's there as a cousin, you know, or you grew up with them, you went to school with them. Everyone's just so peaceful. Everyone just appreciates one another. I think it's kind of people who epitomize Gloucester, in my opinion. It's, you know, it's the true people who really care about the tradition, who really hold this town in their heart. This is a man-made island. So that meant if you needed supplies, well, you either had a long commute to Boston, or you did it here. Up until the creation of the highway bridge in the 50s, when nobody left town. I know people that never had a car. I ate fish six days a week, and I had spaghetti on Sunday. Gotta have the pasta with Sunday. We have to have the pasta with Zugo. It's not gravy, people. I don't care what anyone says. All the boats would be home for the fiesta because they're never home on birthdays. 
They're never home on your anniversary. I mean, my husband, we owned a fishing vessel, and with my first child, wasn't home. It's that one time a year that's the best time of year when just everyone comes together and saying, you know what? We, we don't know what's happened on that side of the bridge. We only know that our fishermen came home because I've had quite a few relatives that didn't come home. If you're at sea, if you're a fisherman, you're facing danger, and you know, one person can do something that nobody else can do, but in doing that, they can save everybody else. So somebody else's gain is everybody's gain. Everybody wins, and that's what a community is. If Stewie won on a Sunday, I would be just as happy for him as if I won. But you hope he falls, too. <laughs> it's just in the end of the day, whoever takes it, he's the guy, he was meant to do it, it was his year. It's a, it's a real strong brotherhood that uh, we're all very proud of. If you were mad at your neighbor all year, you'll get along with them that week. You, put, you seem to put all your differences aside. If you're the next walker behind the guy that's about to walk, and that guy goes out and gets hurt, you're jumping in the water to go and help that guy. You know, we have to watch each other because uh, people do get hurt, so we want to make sure we, we, we take care of that. Would you say this is dangerous? Oh, absolutely. Make no question about it. It's definitely dangerous. You know, bruises, bumps, whatever, it happens. Going out there and walking, it's a battle, you know? And uh, coming in uninjured, you won, you won that battle. I don't think you see too many sane people lining up to do it. You gotta be a little nuts, I guess, to do it. So once a competitor, like, is there staring down you know, the pole, like, once they take that step out there, that's it. They either are gonna walk it or they're gonna fall off. Some of these guys slip and fall and whack themselves pretty good and then take a second whack when they hit the water. You gotta take a beat. You can get spinal injuries. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. I've seen guys hit their head. I've seen people get their eardrums popped out. Hit their face. I got six stitches under my chin. Knock teeth out. I actually broke my, my, broke my ribs three times. That's the most common. That's the most common uh, injury is ribs or skull or whatever or you know, you know what. <laughs> I mean, I joked around. I said, well, if your husband wants to have kids but you really don't, have him walk the pole because you'll love to have it again if you don't know how to walk. I'm telling you. It's, it, I mean, ah! Uh... That's why I have all girls. I have three girls. The greasy pole killed me. With the grease gang. That's us. Somebody's gonna go up on top, Tom, and clean up this little nail. Feet. What you got is uh, full grade grease, biodegradable, very slippery, but the consistency is perfect. There is a process, there is a method to it. We rub it in, put oil in it, rub it in. Pile more on. Just pack it on, pack it on, pack it on. Oh, I hate every minute of it. It's gonna fall. I'm gonna fall. Got yeah, nothing. Tommy, this one's empty. Yeah. Whoa, 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 whoa. Get underneath, get underneath. I care, I'll get covered if I call people. Whoa, what's wrong with you? Yeah, I'm gonna fall. Whoa, 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 Oh, I didn't do that. Oh, gee. See, mine? Mine looks nice and feathered in it. Ba back in our day, it was axle grease. Just like this black gunk. It would make a, 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 a slick of uh, oil. And that's why, you know, we got to stop that. And it's now Crisco, uh, biodegradable edible Crisco. Very slippery still. You know, doesn't hurt the seals and whales and dish, you know, which I would say that grease is very controversial in town. I, I do say, yeah, the grease sucks today. It is what it is. I heard it was a lot easier. Is Crisco slippery? Yes. Is grease slippery? Yes. It's nothing compared to what it was back then. But we're gonna complain about it? Call your congressman. Don't waste my time. Yeah. And staple that to the friggin' thing. We have a sign up at the, at the St. Peter's Club uh, the Wednesday before. And everyone and their mother will call you and their aunts and their uncles. My 
make my nephew this and my my nephew that and my son this and my cousin that and if you put them on that list they see that they think they're wrong that's the problem it gets difficult so who are these guys is tom tough uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, he's had his fair share of words with me. You can't have the inmates run the asylum because someone's going to get hurt. Um, you know, it's got to be organized. People ever, like, threaten you over Oh, this? all the time. I had to have uh, bodyguards a couple years ago, two state troopers. Um, it, it got really crazy, uh, but I had to. Hey, get out of here. Just silly stuff. <laughs> So you have three um, days of the greasy pull. So if you went on Friday, you moved to first on Saturday. And then if you went on Saturday, you moved to first on Sunday. So usually Friday, younger guys trying to make a name for themselves. Uh, the Saturdays, guys have been walking for a few years, got a little bit more experience. Some younger guys, new guys here and there. But Sunday is uh, champions. So, so the courtesy round is just so that everybody gets to have their name called and everybody gets a shot to walk. And then after that, it's, it's game on. Every time, the first time the walkers get up, before we start, we have a little prayer and we say, nobody grab it the first time. Everybody understand that, yeah. Some guys are lucky. They, you know, they have the right steps. They have the right momentum. They have the, you know, the sun is just shining perfect and they get to walk out there, but you, you, you avoid it. You know, you, you do this, you, you touch it, you jump off. So what happens when somebody breaks that rule? They meet the sheriff. You got the enforcer. Who are the, God rest Master Giambacco, he was our enforcer out there. You know, my, my brother, they dedicate him to sheriff. Well, one time, you know, everyone went right to the edge or whatever, and there was one guy. I know that year very well, 1979. It was uh, Sunday of Fiesta, and he ran right out to the end and grabbed the flag. I was nine years old, I'm on the beach. I don't think anybody knew the rules more than I did. I was so into it. And he starts swimming in. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm pissed. I'm nine years old, I'm pissed. And they're all saying, you gotta bring her back. What do you do when you gotta bring her back? This guy is in the water, he looks back at us, he goes, guys, I won. He starts pushing the flag and headed for the beach. It's a bad move on his behalf. Salvi Benson turned around and nobody leave this pole, everybody stay right here. And I remember him pointing out, Matza, JB, go, go get him. So Salvi and Matza dive in like two shots going after him. My buddy Joe Biondo pulls a kid out of his dinghy and throws him in the water. He starts rowing in after him. So this whole crowd is converging on the beach. I'm like, this guy's dead. These guys are crazy tough bastards, you know? And I'm like, this guy's dead. Yeah, hey, Marta, swam all the way into shore. We come to shore. We did get the flag back. He ran his offer. He couldn't refuse. <laughs> And the guy gets up and he raises the flag and all the tourists go, hey! And my body Matza, who was a Golden Gloves boxer, comes out of the water and literally knocks him out, breaks his jaw, knocks him out cold on the beach. Matza don't talk. Matza don't talk. He, he talks right here. A boy today, You know, you're up here, the same thing as everybody else up here. Stay with the rules and do what you got to do, that's all. Yeah, he broke his jaw. He laid him out. The ambulance took him out of there. Yeah, it wasn't pretty. <laughs> they get the flag, go back out there and put it back up, and the tourists are going, wait a minute, you win, and then they beat you up and they put the flag back up. What kind of independence to this? <laughs> I remember the headlines the next day in the paper, and it said, Greasy Paul Walker pummeled on the beach. I was so petrified, I'm saying, like, how am I gonna tell my mother I wound all my whites? <laughs> she says, did you defend your brother? I went, uh-huh. Well, then, good for you. That's what you're supposed to do. Yes, <laughs> yes. And, and you know something? By him doing that, no one will ever do it again. <laughs> That's how we earn the name Sheriff, yeah. You know, there's rules to follow. <laughs>
Oh, oh he's on the injured list. No children for years. <laughs> And for this gentleman, that's an NBA foul right there. He took a dive. We've seen that many a times. This guy, nimble, nimble, I'm done. Just watching the video there, I uh, separated my shoulder. <laughs> I pulled my groin, and I got a concussion. There you go. There's something different about Gloucester. The people that come into this town somehow feel that. Really just the raw emotion that comes out. Whoever comes to Gloucester, it's like, you know, you always mention Fiesta, and they always love Fiesta. Everyone looked forward to Fiesta when you're a kid. Even when you're an adult, you know. You know, we're gonna go watch the greasy pole, you know, all our heroes are out there basically. You're representing, you know, and if the history runs deep. Um, it's a good feeling. So I was always behind Peter Frontero. 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 Peter Black Frontero. Peter Frontero. Peter Frontero, and he would win every single Sunday. Peter Frontero, see ya! I got a little nervous. You're sorry. good? Yeah, just, yeah, no. <laughs> Should I just say Peter Black Frontero? Just say, yeah, I'm Peter uh, Black Frontero. Uh, uh, Keep it short. I'm Greasy Pole Champion. Sure. This is just yeah. like one of those introduction lines. Okay. You know something? He's the greatest of all time. He's the Greasy Pole. Like, he is like the Greasy Pole. Watching the Greasy Pole as a young kid, to me, it was just the most fascinating thing in the world. It really was. I don't know what it was. It just amazed me. Just growing up as a little kid, my, you know, my, I, I heard, you know, friends, um, family members talking about how, how really good my dad was at walking the pole. And uh, he only walked five years and he won three times. I was seven, eight, um, is when I really thought, like, I'm going to be a greasy pole champ someday. I'm going to walk this thing. And I'm going to win it once, you know? I was determined from that age on. And I, I was always about making my dad proud. And I, and I thought the best way to do that, to make my dad proud, is I'm gonna be a champ like him. <laughs> so the day I decided to walk the greasy pole was Sunday, 1984. I was 14 years old. Um, I woke up, I said, I'm walking the pole today. And I thought, yeah, I'm crazy, but I, I'm, I'm gonna do this. I'm walking down, I get, Halfway down in between the firehouse and the thrift shop behind the church, and I don't want to bump into my dad. He doesn't know about it, as far as I know. I just don't want to see him, because I know he doesn't want me out there. I know he would not let me walk. No kidding, I walk between, I'm going up these stairs behind this thrift shop, and there's my dad. He looks at me, he goes, you are trying to walk the pole? And I go, who said that? And he goes, I don't want you out there. You hear me? Don't go out there. He's like, you go out there, I'm gonna kill you. You know, figure of speech. So anyways, I go down. I, did, I didn't know what to think. I'm like, oh my God, I'm actually gonna walk. Like I said, it's my first time ever on the greasy pole. And I look and I see the grease and I see the flag and I'm like, holy, what did I get into? You know, I've never done this. I don't even remember. I just, I black out every time. When I start to walk, it's all. There's just total focus on the flag, nothing else. I don't care about the fall. I didn't care about the grease. I didn't care about the pole. All I cared about was the flag. Peter Frontiero, this guy's got a good shot at it. Walking for his knuckle, Joe Dolly Frontiero. Got a good shot at this. Good chance, good chance. Good chance, good chance! We got a winner, we got a winner, Chuck. Peter Fontero. I just walked right out and grabbed it, and it was just one amazing, one amazing thing. Unbelievable. When I grabbed the flag, I hit the water, and all of a sudden, I go, oh my God, my dad's gonna kill me. First thing I thought. My cousin Peter Fontero, same name, he swims up, and he grabs me, he's all excited, you know, I won, and I'm like, first thing I say to him, Pete, my dad's gonna kill me. And he looks at me and he goes, what are you talking about? You get to the beach, he's gonna be crying. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, okay, my dad's gonna cry, okay. 
the whole time I can't swim. I forgot how to swim. I got a seven foot flag right there, seven foot flag. I'm 5'2 at the time, 114 pounds maybe. I couldn't swim, couldn't hold the flag. I'm like, so my cousin Pete grabs the flag, Coast Guard comes over, I grab the boat. So they lift me up and he goes, take your flag. And I get it and I hold it up. And I look through the crowd and here comes my dad. I saw him coming through and he's going like this. One of the best things I ever saw is a tear come out of my dad's eyes. I turn around to my cousin Pete and I go, Pete, how did you know? Because <laughs> I told you. <laughs> Just the most unbelievable family. Little did you know, it was the beginning of a, a, a great run for him, literally and figuratively. As the day would go by, you'd do all the festivities, you get all psyched up, you know, you buy your costume the week prior and you get all geared up for it and you get one shot at it and Peter would always win it. Let's shake the pole a little bit and we're, you know, let's 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 do this. And no one wanted Peter to win it because he won it so many times. He did it again. Sometimes I you know, I'll be honest with you, sometimes it's like, yeah, big deal. He won a greasing pole, the flag, big deal. I mean, people look at it, they don't know anything about it. And they're like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. But growing up with it, in your family, in your blood, hearing the stories as a little kid, you know, it, it, it's no different, you know, from a kid growing up with Muhammad Ali or whatever as their dad, you know what I mean? And hearing the stories of wanting to be that champ. That's what I gathered out of it. I want to be one of those guys. And for whatever reason, I became the, the guy I am today. As I got older, I said to myself, you know what? I'm gonna start inviting him to my house. You know, he invites everybody over there and he treats them like he's like like they're his kids. The Greasy Pole is an all-day event, and it starts at Peter's house. So I brought everybody together. I, we, we are a brotherhood because I think because of that, more so than back in the day. I love having the parties, I love having the guys here. I love having my family and friends, close friends that still walk it, being part of it. He was an influence on the younger generation, not only because of his, you know, him winning and being the best of his time, um, but because of his passion. The walk is today different from back in the old days. You know, these guys are fishing, we're all, working on fish and then we had two days off and we would go out there and these guys are practicing in their backyards. Derek Hopkins, kid won three days in a row. His dad built a grease ball in his backyard, he's practicing all the time. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly did that and I'm sure other people did too. And then once you're kind of old enough and your parents let you, you go out to the real one. It's kind of like you introducing yourself. So Derek Hopkins, 2019, Friday, Saturday, Sunday champ, 2022, Sunday champ. Okay. Something like that. Yeah. Do you, oh, should we, you want to restart it again since the dog was, my father won it when he was younger and used to just think it was so cool seeing all the guys come up out of the water covered in grease and, you know, always couldn't wait to do it myself. I was working in Boston and we had, there were these piles of poles. It was probably 200 of them. So I made a perfect replica of the greasy pole with the platform and I hung the flags, the Italian flag, American flag. I was like around four years old when he brought home that little mini backyard greasy pole. All right, Derek, have at it. He's small, <laughs> he's only four. He's only like, he's four years old, he's this big. He's not gonna hurt himself. I actually had a little karaoke machine and I'd come out here on the deck and I set it up one time and I had Derek, he had a few of his um, nieces and nep my nieces and nephews, his cousins. I told them to all dress up like Halloween. Whatever Halloween costume you have, you come out. There was probably six or eight of them on the pole, and I was the announcer, one by one. All right, Derek's next, or Jenna's next, or here comes Andrew, or, you know, and on and on, and they would walk. But he would, out of all those kids, and a lot of them were bigger than him, he was only four. He could get to the end all the time, all the time, at a young age. He had, he had balance, and basically what you need out there is balance. Is there added pressure to be walking in your dad's footsteps? Um, there was a little bit the, you know, that first year, because people would see videos of me walking growing up, so when it finally came time for me to do it, it was like, you know, everyone's watching. Now, now is the time to step up and do it. 
because it's one thing to go out and walk it when no one's watching, then you got boats lined up, half the town on the beach, and it's a totally different atmosphere. You only get one go. Knew he had the ability, but on the day, on that Friday, I saw him, and he looked like he might have had one, one too many. And I didn't think, I, I turned to my wife and said, he doesn't have a chance. He comes off for his first courtesy walk. Let's go, buddy. Get it. There you go. And walks out to the end of the flag. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> I guess he does have it. Once I stepped up, I, I, lo I looked out, and I was like, okay, I've done this a million times. Let's just do it one more. And kind of just flushed everything out of my head before I can overthink about, well, which, which foot do I want to go first, this or that. Before I can overthink anything, you just black out and go. And then it's just over like that. Once you hit the water, you go under, and it's this moment of like silence. And then the second you break the surface, It's just air horns and cheering and people coming over and splashing water and screaming. Everyone's all excited. And it's kind of a surreal moment. He proved us wrong that day. They're all looking for the Triple Crown, okay? They want to get Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Very, very rare to do. Once again, I, I knew I could do it. The craziest thing I, when I think back to it is the fact that I actually got the chance because there was tons of guys that are, are good on Friday and a lot of guys that got real close, you know, probably should have had it, but everything, you know, the stars aligned for me that day and I ended up getting my shot, which that's what I find to be the craziest. You want Friday, Saturday, Sunday with how bet than I. That's what they're all looking for. That's a dream, okay? And saying that doesn't happen every day. I was like, all right, here we go. Everyone wants to see, you know, two years off, that was the, the big deal, you know? A couple pounds, a couple years, like, can you still do it? So there was a bit of pressure going into it this year. It's a cool feeling that there's a lot of times where it feels like all eyes are on me. So like when I walk through there, it's just kind of everyone turns and it's like, there he is, champ's here, this or that. And uh, it's an exciting feeling, but then sometimes it's like, you know, you guys can go back to what you're doing and, you know, you don't need to keep looking. You were, you were meant to win that flag and I'm so... I appreciate it, brother. And, and uh, you're such a you're such a good dude. Yeah, there was a, it was a bit of pressure because everyone wanted to know: Can he do it again? Did he lose it? Does he still have it? I had a good feeling, but there was no way to tell because I haven't I, did, I hadn't walked it in two years, so it was really just a matter of getting up there and doing it. And my courtesy walk was my only practice since 2019. Okay, I, I still got this, I didn't lose it. Well, if I get a shot, because now there is a guy in front of me, I think I can do it. I was real nervous, real nervous, but I felt natural. So I, uh, I stepped up, took a good look, and then what, as usual, before I can overthink what foot's going first, the wind, this or that, you know, you just black out, tune everything else out, and go. so quick but I think honestly first couple steps was you know I, I got the I could feel I was like okay this is just you know just like I remember it was uh, I mean great feeling you know because of the two two years off you, you miss that kind of stuff you don't realize you miss it until you see it again he's already being mentioned with some of the, the greatest which is cool you know that's a that's a um, yeah that would it, it makes me feel proud it's cool to me because growing up, you hear all those names and you want to be like them. And now I'm kind of sitting in that seat and 
doing what I had hoped I would do when I was younger. He just makes it look way too easy. You know, he's, my opinion, he's gonna be the greatest of all time. He's gonna break everybody's record. Derek Hopkins is a, a amazing walker. I think he'd probably shatter my record. Yeah, he might break my record. Yes, he probably will. And I'll be the first one there to shake his hand when he does. I don't want my record to be broken, but hats off to him if he does it. Only time will tell. No way to know, but we'll see. Gloucester is a pretty tight-knit town. Everyone kind of knows everyone. And for the most part, everyone gets along. That's a unique, special thing. You can feel the passion of the people. It's something unique about it. The Fiesta Weekend is a town-wide event. It's our family tradition, uh, something that brings me back to my roots, um, something that my grandmother did, my grandparents did. It's the whole town coming together and celebrating and honoring St. Peter and honoring our fishermen, and honoring the, the dedication that it takes. Emil Durkheim, a famous sociologist, said that ultimately that what people are doing when they worship a god or a saint is worshiping themselves, worshiping society. Um, so I think the key here is that this is a community. This is a group of people who have a sense of belonging together, and that belonging stretches into the past and they want it to stretch into the future. So if this is one moment along that path, it's a path of continuity, right? For future generations to look back and to see that. It's like being with a big family. When we think of the ways we relate to a family, there's, there's a, a sense of like giving, of, of total sacrifice to give and to take and to know somebody's gonna be there for you like you're gonna be there for them. If you've got a few hundred people like that, that feels really good. Gloucester, like a lot of traditional working communities and working waterfronts, is in a state of flux. 90% of our seafood in this country is imported. The guys that are out there right now are getting prices that my dad saw in the 80s, and that's not fair. Because the fishing industry is gone, so many boats used to donate. They had a donation board everywhere of what boat donated, how much of the fiesta would be at. And that's how they did it, you know? I think that we're absolutely in a dire time of transition right now. Um, the generations are moving on. There's people getting older. We have the 100th anniversary coming up in a few years, and uh, I want to make it to that. And, uh, you know, before I leave this planet, um, I want to make sure that I pass it on. I've always made a point to be part of it, right, so it doesn't die out. Um, traditions die out. It's an up uplifting event for our city, and, you know, it'd be, I think it would be devastating to lose Fiesta. As each generation moves on, if the younger generation isn't as passionate, you know, it could, if they're not willing to step up and, you know, carry on tradition, it very well could fade away. It's, it's unimaginable. I mean, I can't, I honestly can't imagine Gloucester without the St. Peter's Fiesta. You know something, when we, were, when we were little, we didn't appreciate this place. You know, the older you get, the more you appreciate Gloucester. One of the neat things about Gloucester and, and being a historian here is um, you really start understanding how unique we are. There's something real about Gloucester. There is no place on earth like the place we come from. They say this city sucks. You suck. This city is one of the most beautiful this is on earth, and there is no place like it. No we are a part of a crew of savages that get to participate in a game that oh. no one else on earth gets to do. Yeah. I want to hear you like you are the only ones on earth who get to walk this. How would you describe the makeup of, of this place? Unique. Wonderful, um, kind, generous, yet 
powerhouse. Yes. I hear this from so many people. There's just something here that they can't find anywhere else. That ocean can make you the happiest person. You're laughing, you're splashing, or you can find out that that ocean took someone away from you and break your heart forever. No matter what we are, when it comes to a crisis, we're like this, it doesn't matter. And it's remarkable because I'll tell you something, I've been through a lot, and if it wasn't for the people holding me up, you don't know, you just don't know. And I wish everyone could have that kind of security. I wish that on every little child that's out there having a little bit of problem, to have that today. I mean, I, I, I travel all over the world for work, and. There's no place like this. We would pick different things around the, the neighborhood, whether it was a fence or a curb, and you'd walk it and pretend you were walking the greasy pole. Yeah, I used to like walk backstops, the softball fields. Some people walk the train tracks. I've heard that because the flatness on the top of the train track is similar to the flatness on the top of the pole. Well, my name's Howard Blackburn. I was lost for days at sea. In a winter storm in my trawl and made in 1883. With frostbit hands, I rode for land 60 miles away. Poor Tom, before he froze to death, had nothing good to say. He said, Howard, you won't make it to shore. There ain't no power in our hands like people. And one thing the survivor understands You roll with your heart, not with your hands You roll with your heart, not with your hands Hey! I have a fear of sharks, yes I think that's why I never fell off the pole <laughs> What was your strategy? I mean, how did you win all those? I grew my toenails long <laughs> Have I done the greasy pull? No. Will you see me on the greasy pull? Never. I lost all my fingers, half of both my thumbs. I ran around in Gloucester Bar for fishermen's and bums. I bragged I'd sail the aura in a tiny sloop alone. They laughed until I did it twice and broke their scarpatone. But I said one thing, this survivor understands. You would know that everyone's relatives are coming. Everyone was here enjoying a feast. Open house everywhere you went. We, we, we cooked for 300 people and didn't even know half of them. The mentality is the Sicilians, if God forbid something happens, they're going to go with the full stomach. I don't know. I lost all my fingers, half of both my thumbs. I ran around and glossed a bar for fishermen's and bums. I bragged I'd sail the aura in a tiny sloop alone. They laughed until I did it twice and broke their scarpatone. And I said one thing, this survivor understands. Wow, oh, you dream with your heart, not with your hands. Hey! My grandfather was a multi-time champ in Italy. He always said to me, he said, stare at the flag. You look at your feet, you're gonna, you're gonna fall. Focus plus footwork equals flag. <laughs> That's my motto to everybody. You know, I would do it if St. Peter himself came down and walked that greasy pole. Otherwise, I'm safe on the sidelines.